distinguished guests, academic colleagues, Professor Painter's family, his mother, his sister, his wife, his two children, friends, tenakoto, tenakoto, kiora, koto, katoa, and welcome to the inaugural professorial lecture of Gavin Painter. I'm Wendy Lana, I'm the provost here at Victoria University of Wellington, and it's my very great pleasure to host you this evening. Professor Painter's expertise is an illustration of the calibre of the staff we have here at Victoria, New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university and New Zealand's first ranked university for research quality. Professor Painter's research interests are in the emerging area of chemical immunology and developing new treatments for allergies, cancer and other infectious diseases that harness the body's own immune system to fight the disease. His work is at the leading edge of an exciting area of discovery. As Professor Painter will explain in his lecture, the notion of using the body's immune system to fight cancer is not new and traces back to experiments in the 1890s by Dr William Colley. But the field has built momentum in recent years and is sparking huge public interest. I'd now like to briefly introduce Gavin before handing over to him to deliver his lecture. Gavin completed his honours degree and PhD in chemistry at the University of Otago. After completing postdoctoral research at Cambridge University in 1999, he joined the carbohydrate chemistry team at Industrial Research Limited in Lower Hutt. Since then, Industrial Research Limited has formed into the Ferrier Research Institute at Victoria University. And Gavin has progressed through a number of roles, initially as a research scientist and now as a science team leader, where he leads research in the design and synthesis of drugs, vaccines and immunotherapeutics. Gavin has an ongoing collaboration with immunologists at the Maligan Institute of Medical Research for his work on cancer immunotherapy. He also collaborates with synthetic chemists, pharmacologists, immunologists and clinicians from universities around New Zealand and more locally in the Capital and Coast District Health Board. Gavin is an active researcher, having been published in over 60 peer-reviewed journal articles and has many conference presentations to his name. He is a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Chemistry and a member of the Australian Society of Immunology and the New Zealand Society for Oncology. His work has seen him involved in nine patents and just recently he led the discovery and patenting of a new immunotherapy cancer treatment alongside Maligan's Dr. Ian Hermans. The groundbreaking treatment is now being progressed to clinical trials by the newly established company, Avalia Immunotherapies. Gavin's lecture tonight is titled, as hopefully you can see, yes, Cancer Immunotherapy Products from Sugar, Fat and Protein. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Professor Gavin Painter. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. It's uh, indeed a great pleasure to be here tonight and, and speak to you. And I did the first thing right and I remembered to turn on the mic for the Cameraman, so brilliant, off to a great start. And Wendy, thank you for such a lovely uh, introduction. That was uh, uh, very, very nice. So, cancer immunotherapy uh, products from sugar, fats, and, and proteins. And when we talk about synthetic chemistry, people often think about chemicals, and they think about chemicals as being these uh, toxic things and these rather interesting molecules. But in actual fact, what I'm going to explain tonight, or, or what I hope to explain tonight, is that everything that we need to make synthetic vaccines uh, comes from fat, protein, or sugars. 
Okay, well, obviously family is really important, so I thought I'd start with family. And uh, up there we have, what do we have up there? Yep, it's the same as what I can see. That's brilliant. So my wife, Sarah, and uh, two children. And the reason I started with this was the children, actually, they said, Dad, what are you going to talk about tonight? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to talk about my work. And then they kind of both, you know, it didn't take too long. They said, Dad, you're not going to go off on tangents, are you? You're not going to talk about a whole lot of tangents. And, well, you know, well, I, I, I guess I have one hour to uh, talk about tangents. And so, yeah, so there will be a few tangents here and there. And... Uh, also in this photo is my uh, mother, uh, mum supported myself and two sisters, uh, made sure we were well educated and if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have had the opportunity. So thank you very, very much, uh, mum. Both of my sisters too, they, they had a great, uh, important roles to play. Uh, they looked after me, I'm the youngest, the baby of the family. So uh, with, without their help, who knows what would have happened. And, and mum actually left the Dunedin area for a while and they both uh, looked after me at, at different times. So uh, thank you to Denise and Trudy. It's, it's ironic that I was rushing around and didn't actually find a photo of, of Trudy in time and she, in, for this lecture. And the reason that's strange actually is because she's actually the famous one of all of us. She was New Zealand high, high jump champion for, for six years in a row. And you know, you're probably not surprised at that when you look at me and you see my height. <laughs> It's not surprising. Yeah. yeah. So family, hugely important. Um, okay, so the thing about tangents, we're talking about immunotherapy problem, uh, products uh, from sugars, fats, and proteins, and how do you get to this? How do you get to Wellington's traffic? Well, I guess when we think about sugars, fats, and proteins, most of us probably don't think of synthetic vaccines. We probably think of food. I actually probably think of food, especially at the end of the day. We think of food, and right now there's a huge debate going on about how much our government should be getting involved with legislating food. It doesn't really matter what you think, it's a debate. If you take the debate a little bit further, you'll, you'll find that people might start thinking about traffic, you might be thinking about why aren't you cycling, and it doesn't take too much to come to the next debate is that, you know, do we have proper, safe cycleways? So there you go, girls. <laughs> you know, I, I don't really go on tangents often. So it turns out that, that the, the house that we live in, we're really fortunate. It's exactly halfway between where Sarah works and where I work. And I pretty much reckon if you draw a straight line and put a thing in the middle, that's actually where we live. Uh, it's also in between where the girls go to school. It's also close to a train station, and it's also close to uh, the central uh, shopping mall. But of course, things change, and and uh, with change comes opportunities, and now I get the chance now and again to actually get on the bike and actually cycle in these beautiful mornings uh, into, into Wellington, and it's great. Okay, so sugars, proteins, and fats. Probably maybe this is what you think of when you think of sugars. White sugar, maybe that's what you think of. I think of sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide. So it's two molecules. Let's see if I can just use this. Looks like I can use this. That's great. So it's, it's two sugar molecules uh, bonded together, a glucose and a fructose. And yeah, fructose is getting, getting a bit of bad publicity. Fructose, it really does look kind of dangerous, doesn't it? But that's fructose. But if we used a different word and we, we said carbohydrate, we might think slightly differently. These are potatoes. These are carbohydrate. Basically, they're a really good source of glucose. But now, instead of a disaccharide, it's a polymer, all joined together, they're carbohydrates. If we think a little bit more, actually, that's true. Children, that's right. Vegetables are carbohydrates. But there's a difference. You know, the, the sugars and the carbohydrates and vegetables are more complex. And you can actually just tell by looking at it, there's more variety. So as you come down this chain, you look, you're getting more variety, more complication. So protein... Maybe, maybe that's what you see when you think of protein. What I think of are amino acids. It's not true, actually. I do think of a steak. <laughs> but amino acids, so these are the building blocks of life. So really, that's what protein is. These are individual, um, these are individual amino acids that can react together to form an amide bond. So, actually it's true, I forgot to say, I am a 
I am a professor of chemistry, so there is going to be some chemistry. So this is the chemistry. This is a chemical reaction. We take an electron rip centre and you react it with an electron poor centre. So the amine is electron rich, the carbonyl is electron poor. They come together, they form a new bond, and if you do that enough times, you have something called a peptide, and if you do it even more and more, you have something called a protein. And they are the, the fundamental building blocks of life. Of course, fat. I guess we can think of different things with fat, but this is butter, and it's full of saturated fat. And that's true, that's possibly the bad one. So this is a saturated fat drawn down here. It's a long carbon chain. Each one of these lines between here and here represents a carbon bond between two carbons we normally don't draw in the, protein, the protons. So that's fat, a long chain lipid, if you like. But you might know a little bit more, and you might actually know, well, actually, aren't there good fats? Aren't there different kinds of fats? And it's true, there are. And then you might actually know a little bit more, and that could be, well, aren't there fats in protein? And it's absolutely true. So this is why um, salmon gets, gets a good rap, because it has so-called good fats. It has fats that, looks like, that look like this. These are the omega-3 fats. On the other hand, red meat has different kinds of fats. They're not all bad, but it does have, have, have this one in particular. This is called arachidonic acid, and if you have too much of that fat, that's possibly not a good thing. The reason it's not a good thing is it's a building block for group of chemicals, and they are chemicals, called ecarcinoids, and they can have inflammatory uh, phenotypes and signaling. So basically, it's very... When I think of these things, I think of building blocks to make vaccines. I don't just think of food. OK, so where did I get... You know, where, you know, where, where, did, where did my interest from, from chemistry come from? And I'm going to actually start... Um, with my university career, I'm going to actually go backwards uh, towards the very end of the lecture. And one of the things that interests me was building, building frameworks, carbon-carbon bonds. And this is this concept in the top of an electron-rich uh, centre reacting with an electron-poor centre. A nucleophile reacts with an electrophile, and you form a new chemical bond between them. And it's really all about bringing molecules together. So the particular chemical reaction that was lectured to us in my undergrad days at university that I really took a liking to, to was this chemical reaction. So th this is just part of a molecule and it has some reactive groups in it. And in this case, the reactive group is called an enone. And if you know something about molecular orbitals and electron density, you know that an, an alpha beta unsaturated ketone has two areas where it's electron poor. So uh, these areas here that we can label as delta plus. So if we make an organometallic agent, and I've even drawn in the negative charge to hopefully make it easy beside the metal, the metal, then this negative species can react with the positive species. And you can have a chemical reaction that takes place like this. And if that R group is another molecule, you have brought two molecules together. But the thing that really intrigued me about this reaction is that if you just added a little bit of copper to, to your organolithium, you completely change the whole chemical reaction. And now the nucleophile added to a different position of the molecule. And if you're actually really clever and you did things really carefully, you could actually do ke two chemical reactions in one. You could add the one down the bottom in the four position, and then you could trap the enolate. So that was really, when I saw that up on the I think it was a blackboard in those days. I was really excited and uh, it really got me thinking about synthetic organic chemistry. Of course, this is the University of Otago, and it looks like that every day, and at least that's what my mother says. So I went on to do my PhD with uh, Rob Smith, Robin Smith, and he set me up in terms of all the skills I needed to be able to travel overseas and do postdoctoral research. I was really fortunate, and I got to travel across the world and, and, and got to go to Cambridge. For those of you that don't know, this is the River Cam. Those funny little flat boats are called punts, and people um, get pushed along there, um, tourists, to have a look around the back of all the colleges. So this is uh, Andy Holmes, was my postdoctoral fellow supervisor, and his college was uh, Clear College, 
you might recognise the slightly more famous King's uh, Cathedral next door. So this is the Clear Bridge, and I'm going to tell a couple of little stories about the Clear Bridge. Uh, the first one, as you can see, I've blown it up. There are these little balls on the top of it. Does anyone know the story why there's a little segment missing? I can make it up then. <laughs> so, so the story goes is that there was some dispute with the person who built the bridge, obviously over money, and he felt like he was never properly paid for the job. So as the story goes, he never completed it, and this segment is to symbolise that. <clears throat> But the story that's perhaps a little bit more funny or interesting, depending on how you look at it, was a student prank. So they made some paper mache balls of the big concrete balls that sit on the bridge. And you can imagine they did this, they worked hard. Oh, and I forgot a little bit. So what would happen in the weekend is a load of tourists would come into Cambridge. And quite often the people that did the punting thing, students were making money, they lashed two punts together, so you had two boats side by side, and they could get more people by doing that, and I guess they could make more money. But the Japanese in particular, they like to kind of stay together in groups, and so they would often be in these double punts, if you like. So the group of students made the paper, paper mache replica, and they, of course they, they rolled it out onto the bridge, and they waited for one of these double punts to come down the can. And you can imagine what they did. They waited, they waited, and then they made sure that they were inside. And they, they, they picked up the big, heavy paper mache ball. They rolled it to the side as it was coming over. And all the Japanese were looking up, screaming and gasping. And they all jumped out of the boat <laughs> as they jumped in. It's kind of funny. And, um, but I think, the thing about the cam is that all the sewers from the colleges used to just flow straight into it. And it, you can see it doesn't flow so fast. And also, there used to be horses that used to drag uh, towed carriages down there as well. So it was a pretty... There's actually cobbles on the bottom of it in some parts. Uh, but they haven't done that for a number of years. But even so, I mean, close to where we live, people fished. And I certainly wouldn't be here, those fish. Uh, so anyway, the people jumped out, and it was all a horrible big fiasco. But the really, the really interesting bit of the story was what happened to the students. So, and in particular, the term that was used, I was amazed by this bit. So they were kicked out of the university. But the term that was used was that you were sent down. And I thought that was a really interesting thing, meaning that, obviously, wherever you went from Cambridge had to be down. So that was the place I was at. Uh, but it was truly a fantastic opportunity. So my job there was to do some chemistry, so very briefly talk about some protecting group chemistry. And this is just a, a concept. So in chemistry, if we're trying to make molecules, we often have a number of reactive centres or groups in a molecule. If we want to manipulate one of those centres, generally what we do, or at least one approach, is that we temporarily protect the other protecting groups so you can carry out your work in the area of the molecule that you want to. So this is a schematic example. Through selectivity, we could protect one of these hydro hydroxyl groups as a benzyl group. Then we could do this as a glycosylation reaction in the carbohydrate chemistry team, so that's kind of cool. We could then react this centre, put a sugar on, and then we would deprotect. So if we were making a molecule that had any kind of bioactivity, Normally, you'd always need to deprotect at the end of the synthesis. So, really, again, an illustration, but what you might want to do with a real molecule from nature, it would have lots of these different groups. And just for argument's sake, I've labelled them one through six. There may be 10 or 20 individual synthetic steps you have to go through. But often what would happen, the benzyl group is a very robust, um, versatile protecting group and you often end up with all of your reactive groups protected as a benzyl group. And then in the very final step, you release uh, the benzyl group and you get your reactive groups, and this is going to be your active molecule that you tried to make. So, okay. So my job was to make these compounds called uh, phosphatidyl inositol phosphates. They had been discovered as second messengers in some very important cell signal transduction pathways. So I was supposed to get into the lab and make all these different variations of these molecules. And in particular, the people just down the road, the 
biologists we were working with, they wanted this compound here. It was called PIP3. Let's just call it PIP3. The reason they're interested in it is because it was reported in the literature that a kinase inside a cell would add a phosphate into this position and that would become an active second messenger. And so, <clears throat> the, so the work I, I got to follow there was extremely well done. The person before had done, and the person before him, they'd both done a, a, amazing work and they'd sorted out all the synthetic roots. I really just had to make a whole lot more material but one thing, I had to get the final step to work. And so one of the things in synthetic organic chemistry is that quite often you work with what we call organic soluble molecules. But the, the final molecule that you make for nature, the really, really important one that's going to have the activity, quite often has different properties to all of those organic soluble compounds. And it's really important that you get the final step right. And so the material that had been made prior now, this wasn't quite right. There was something a little bit odd about it. And back in those days, we didn't have really access to mass spec. You only ever used mass spectrometry when you had your nice purified product to prove what you had. You didn't use it along the way as, a, uh, in, as an IPC, so an in-process control tool, as we would today. And I won't really go into the details, but I just want to mention John Burton, so he's now an associate professor at Oxford. And for any students that want to do further studies um, he, in, in synthetic organic methodology, if you can get into his group, I would strongly recommend it. He's absolutely class and a really, really nice person as well. And he just made this comment one day that was kind of a throwaway comment for him, but it was very important for me. And he said, well, you know, like, you know, when you do hydrogenolysis, so the reaction to remove all of the benzyl groups looks like this. This bit is the protecting group, and we simply want to go down to the hydroxyl. We won't do the mechanism because I don't think you'll appreciate it. Probably I don't remember it anyway. So <clears throat> you, hydrogenolysis means you kind of break or, or some kind of fission. But what you can do with these catalysts, you can also hydrogenate. So that means you add hydrogen to a double bond. And it's, and it's a thing when a student or actually professional scientist as well uh, gets to the end of a synthesis, you always have this tension that you've got all these protecting groups and you haven't got the conditions quite right, you're not quite getting rid of all of them, so what do you need to do? You need to hit it hard. You need to hit it really, really, really hard. You want to use the best catalyst, you want to use a whole lot of pressure because you need hydrogen and you want to cook it up and you want to, you know, you want to heat it. And, and what was happening was that when I finally convinced Andy, well, actually, I think we needed to do a little bit more mass spec on the crude products to look at what was going on, we were getting signals of plus 96. And basically what was happening is that we were actually hydrogenating the, uh, the phenol ring. This is a much harder reaction to do, but you only need a very small amount of it because we were taking off 10 or 12 of these groups in one day, one go. So anyway, we worked that out, and all of a sudden, all kinds of things happened. So... This is my first exposure to working with biologists. When I first went down there, they were at, this, at the Babraham Institute, about five miles outside of Cambridge. So I needed to cycle down there. That was actually really fun in the English countryside in summer. A little bit different in winter, but still fun. I cycled down there, got to the big security gate and said, I'm oh, from Cambridge, and they just kind of looked at me really weird because they have some funny going-ons down there because they do experiments with animals and things like that. So the security was immense. So it took me about 20 minutes to convince the person at the gate that I was actually supposed to be there. So I got in, and then it took another 20 minutes for Len actually to arrive. And when he arrived, he was had his gumboots on, he had blood, or he had been doing something with um, <clears throat> bovine brain to get the enzyme called PI3 kinase. And so and he took great delight in... Um, wiping his hands and then shaking mine. I thought this was quite funny. And to cut a long story short, the first materials I gave them didn't actually work that well, and, and it wasn't until I'd realised this problem that we had in, in our chemistry that we actually got uh, proper products to them that started to work. And once, um, you know, these guys really, really didn't want to know me, to be totally honest. They had more important things to do but as soon as they worked out that the materials I gave them were active, everything changed. 
in I'd ring them up on the phone and say, oh, Len, I've just you know, I've made a little bit of that material, or, or once they've found that a sample actually worked, and then they would be on my doorstep in 10 minutes, these guys that would not. And then I actually did make a bit of a slip at one point, and I managed to somehow tell them that I'd made a whole 20 milligrams of something, and they were very excited by this. And what I hadn't realised was that was more than enough that they could use for the whole lab to barter with other labs to get other proteins and bits and pieces. So, but anyway, they did remember us when it comes to publication, uh, and there was a number of publications that come out of this, and by providing that material to them, they uh, elucidated a key step in the cell signal transduction pathway. So I need to move on, and this is the field 10 years later. Pretty much every company around the world has a PI3 kinase inhibitor. So the thing went big, and it was based on that understanding. So that was a great, um, great experience for me. So yeah, so the learnings, yeah, don't go drinking with the Irish. And so I wish I could do an Irish accent, and I did practice, but it was hopeless. So I'm not even going to try and do it. But there was, we had a few Irish in the lab, and often what would happen in the UK, someone might say, I have to say, I was there for a year before my girlfriend, now wife, um, arrived. So I did work hard, but I also had a little bit of time to have the odd and the pale. And, <clears throat> and I did actually learn uh, how to drink socially. So that would mean you would go down to the pub after work and you would literally have two drinks. So that means if I went with Mike, he would buy me one and I would buy him one and he would do our good thing and we'd go home for dinner. Um, but what the Irish would say, what Ken would say, let's go and have three and you think, well, actually, that's not so different from two. But it really is, because in Britain, it's a strictly, you know, you do rounds. So if someone says you're going to have three, that actually means you have to have four. <laughs> and the difference between two and four is, well, that's enough for me. And that probably meant you probably had a curry somewhere and you probably missed dinner at home. But it was a really fun time, and uh, it was fantastic. But chemistry is more fun with biologists. That's what I really learnt. I really learnt. But you need to make sure you give them what they want, not what you want. Um, just because you've got your fancy chemistry, it's not good enough if it doesn't do the thing for them. But <clears throat> I learnt something else. I, I learnt that if your girlfriend follows you to the other side of the world, if she's a medic, you know, there might be a bit of a clicking, um, sorry, clicking, a ticking uh, um, time bomb going on there. And so I didn't actually realise that I had six months, but luckily <laughs> I got the right words out there after five and a half months. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you for agreeing to, mar to marry me. So one more story to that, um, one more little bit to that story. So then we won't go into the details of exactly how it happened, but that happened and it was all good. So then I actually needed to ring up Sarah's parents and, and ask, and I thought, well, that was kind of cool. I was actually really looking forward to that. So I picked up the phone, and we'd been in the UK. I'd been there for a little bit longer than her. But we didn't have a lot of Kiwis would come and visit us, but we didn't have Kiwis with us every day or necessarily Australians. I rang up um, Sarah's parents, and I got her mum, and I thought, gosh, do we, do we speak like that? <laughs> that was really strong. So she... <laughs> told me a whole lot of things and it was fine, it was very polite and I waited and then I got over to Sarah's dad and then he had a lot of things to say about the farm and that was fine and then so finally I got my opportunity and I said to him, you know, would you mind, you know, could I marry your daughter, would, that, would you be okay with that? And there was just a silence and I thought, well, I thought things were good but, you know, I was thinking all these crazy things and when I first met Graham, um, I, I arrived at their farm and it was a beautiful day and the sun was out, and apparently I learned afterwards that means I got past Sarah's mum, because if you could see Mount Ruapehu from their back um, lawn, then you were okay. But if it was raining on the first day that you arrived, you'd better watch out. So it was okay, I got there, the sun was shining, it was all good, and I ended up speaking with Graham, Sarah's dad, out the back, and he asked me, he said, oh, so what position do you play? <laughs> So I want to play football. He said, oh, football, I don't you know, what game is that? And, and then a few days later, we were out with the sheep and things, and I'm not actually sure what happened, but I didn't realise sheep could jump. 
you know, if you ever, sheep can actually jump over gates. So somehow, it actually was Sarah's fault, not mine, but somehow all the sheep ended up all down the road and then the neighbour come across and, was, you know, Graham was kind of looking around and I heard him walking away saying to the neighbour, well, I don't think he's stood on grass before. So all these things were kind of coming back and I was, you know, I kind of thought things were so bad and then there was a, you're not really sure, there was actually a bit of crying and a bit of other stuff going on and I was actually beginning to worry but I think as it turned out, it was, it was positive emotion, so it was all, all right. Sorry, a little bit long on that story. I, there was a tangent, uh, yeah, three minutes too long. So, um, so then I come back to New Zealand. I got a fantastic opportunity through a, a postdoc scholarship mechanism we don't have anymore uh, and to work with in Richard Furno's group at IRL at the time. And, you know, the project was great and we kind of knocked that on the head pretty quickly and I probably did get a little bit bored. Richard had the foresight, the insight to see that and he hooked me up to do some commercial fee-for-service contracts. And I want to talk about that because I think it's really, really important. It taught me taught me more skills. It taught, well, skills, it, it, taught, it gave me an experience that I needed. And that main experience was that if you've spent a client's money and you haven't got to where they think you should have got to, when you have the phone call with them on the Friday morning, because it's probably in the US, probably be morning our time, you want to be really, really sure that you were rigorous and you did everything right that you could have done for that chemical reaction. And it, it taught me that our time in the lab was priceless, that it was a privilege to do our own research, um, and also it meant that you got exposed to some of the latest chemistry and why people were making certain molecules in certain areas. So it was a, a fantastic experience. And Richard has always, through his um, business development skills, has always brought in commercial fee-for-service contracts into the Institute, and we have needed those contracts uh, to survive. Phil Rendell now manages those and spends a lot of time. But the, and I just want to make a point. They're an important learning for us all. And also, if you're a student and you're thinking about that you want to have a job in chemistry, some of the chemistry that happens in these commercial contracts is some of the best, exciting, challenging chemistry that I've ever seen. And if anyone says that commercial fee-for-service chemistry is industrial chemistry, don't think of it like that. It's the most exciting thing. And so that's why I put this up. I had an opportunity to uh, team up with Keith Clincher around the early 2000s to make this molecule called kyphenensin. It's a manosidase inhibitor. People use that in um, the expression of enzymes if you want to make enzymes that have a high mannose content. So once enzymes are, are made inside our cells, they're often glycosylated and transported around the body. And the, cly cly gosh, the glycosylation states, that means you put sugars on proteins, that's important for the function of the protein. And you can go and have a look at the books and, and the original movies, but the original uh, movie was called Lorenzo's Oil. It was followed up a little bit later by um, a second movie called Extraordinary Measures. And I just wanted to say that you know, Richard Ferno is our Harrison Ford. <laughs> but an important thing, um, and so Paul Benjes, who, who manages glycosin, this is a really important relationship for uh, the ferrier and, and yeah, some great chemistry. So I learned a lot from that. I'm not going to talk too much about this collaboration at all because uh, we're going to have some other lectures during the year from Gary Evans and Peter Tyler, and this is uh, their relationship. But I did have the privilege to be able to work with Vern Tram from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. The reason I mention it because it reinforced my positive feedback I'd had with working with biologists in Cambridge. Once I'd given them something that actually worked, that was. And also chemistry, just a little bit about the chemistry. Again, it's about bringing molecules together. So we've got an azo, um, a ribotol azo compound coming with a deazo purine coming together to form um, this chemical bond and bringing these two molecules together. So another great experience that I had working with Richard. And then again, with Richard's support, um, back in the days when I could actually get some funding, <clears throat> I was able to get a, a, a Marsden fund and you know it was a great opportunity. And it was to make some 
compounds from the cell wall of mycobacteria. And that gave me the opportunity to form a collaboration with Dave Larson. He was the academic supervisor. I was able to mentor PhD student Gary Ainge. We're able to make molecules that look like this. And sorry, I probably forgot to be. Yes, yeah, so, so this, this is a phosphatidyl and also, well, actually, this, let's just call this a phospholipid. But this is the lipid, the sugar, sorry, the lipidy bit. This is the sugar bit. It's a different sugar now. It's a mannose sugar. But we've got some sugar, we've got some fat. And inositol almost wants to be a sugar, but it's not quite a sugar. So we made, we made those molecules. And in a Marsden grant, you don't have a lot of extra money, but we managed to eke out a little bit of money for some biology, biological support. We'd like to acknowledge Michelle Denny was able to fit in some great work uh, for us, able to get some great immunology. He was able to publish some immunological papers, and then his data really helped us publish our chemistry. So uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, unfortunately, and rather tragically, he did die a couple of years, rather suddenly, a couple of years after the end of this grant. So an another thing that happened in this grant was that we, were, we teamed up with an international set of collaborators that were um, structural biologists. And so this here is a picture of a molecule called CD1D. And, you know, at the time I didn't know how important that would become for me. So CD1D is what's called a lipid antigen presentation molecule. So this is all the big, the red and the yellow. And the molecule we made here is sitting in its binding clip. And it's a very similar architecture to some MHC molecules that we're going to talk about in a moment. But what this connection with... Is it, this is, Sorry, this is... Um, Dirk Zions here, he's now standing in front of the La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology, and that's a fantastic place to visit. It's only about half a mile down the road from Torrey Pines Golf Course. So, unlike some of my colleagues, Gary and Peter, I haven't had the privilege to play there yet, but I do intend to um, one day. <clears throat> so, with that um, came other connections, and through the American network, People uh, wanted us to make different compounds for their projects, and we ended up making compounds like this. This is what we would call a glycolipid, so it's simply a lipid bit, and it has a sugar on the end. In this case, the sugar is a galactose. And quite often, these compounds are found in nature. They have this little extra little bit here. This turns a carbon-carbon single bond into a double bond, and that's really important for the function of these compounds but it's also an important consideration in the synthesis because when we want to chemically synthesize these compounds, we can't use that famous benzyl group anymore because when we removed it by hydrogenolysis, we would almost certainly hydrogenate out the double bond, so it would be no good. So you had to use other protecting groups and you tended to use acid-sensitive protecting groups on the sugar. But what happened when we followed the literature the reported methods in the literature from these really big papers, we found that you got mixtures of products and all kinds of things started to happen with the double bonds. So I actually haven't published the chemistry for this yet, so I can't really talk to you about the details, but I just want to acknowledge that Benji Compton, uh, who, who works, uh, still works with, works with us now, um, was able to develop some fa fantastic methodology to make these compounds in a highly pure form. And what that enabled us to do was to again team up with our networks of researchers in the US and we got to, got, you know, we were fortunate and we, able, we were able to co-publish on some, some really big papers and we got to learn a little bit more about some different immunology. But at this point, uh, Mars and Grant was coming to an end and starting to contemplate things and I was thinking about the amazing relationship that we had with Vern Tram and we were able to supply our chemicals into some of these really big labs in the US. But, you know, things weren't really, it just wasn't at the level that our relationship was with Moon Tram. So, you know, in discussion, I was thinking about this, and really what the problem was is that we had no control over the compounds that we were making for these groups. We were simply making things that other people had made before they'd found difficult to make. Perhaps we were making them slightly better but we had no intellectual property or no control. So really it was fairly simple. We needed to come back together. We needed to generate some intellectual property locally. So this was kind of the, I don't know, the, 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 the thought process. Then we wanted to still publish in those high impact journals, but now we'd be publishing the compounds that we designed 
we um, discovered locally, and then hopefully that would be good enough to get some of this international network coming back to us. But now they wouldn't be coming back to us because we were good at chemistry, they were coming back to us because they actually liked their compounds. And really that's what biologists like, they like the activity in the compounds, not really so fussed about the intricate details of your chemistry. So, cut a long story short, these photos are a little bit out of order, but they'll do. So this is Phil Rendell, so he was actually really the mastermind of putting together um, a, a, well, I'm just going to call it an MB program because all the names are changing. And he, he thought about how to bring together these groups from across New Zealand. He was able to link together what people wanted to do in some kind of contractual arrangement if something worked and, you know, and, and was able to bring all this together. And I have to say, that was really ahead of its time, this program. So we talk now about national science challenges. We talk about there's a lot of great cause. But when you actually drill down into those and you start talking about intellectual property and how would it work and are you really collaborating together, I think there's still ways to go in some of those programs. So Phil was able to do that. He had some input from Shivali. This photo is actually from a um, Christmas party and there's a story there about some toothbrushes that uh, Phil's about to give Shivali Gulab and you can ask Phil about that story. It has nothing to do with me. <clears throat> so what we were able to do in this grant, and, and so my Mars and Grant had finished, uh, Grant of Phil's uh, had finished, we decided to come together. And we come together with immunological groups around New Zealand. We had some chemistry from Otago, we had some formulation from Otago, and we were able to do this collaborative thing together. And really, the thing that popped out of it um, for us, is it actually, in fact, it didn't actually just pop out, that actually took quite a bit of work. And, and really the thing was, is that I always, I guess I'd always thought that the, you know, that the immunology was actually leading the chemistry, but in fact it wasn't really. We were still pushing our chemical drugs onto our immunologists, and it wasn't until we kind of stopped and actually thought, well, actually, you know, we need to be making the molecules that our immunological and biological partners are really interested in. And when that happened, um, things began to change. So this is where I started to, we started to collaborate with Ian Hermans, Ian's interested, he was interested already at that time in this thing called cancer immunotherapy. He was doing it with these really weird cells called NKT cells. And so we were really fortunate to be able to key into uh, Ian's uh, research trajectory. So now I'll talk a little bit about cancer immunotherapy. And I think the way to talk about cancer immunotherapy is to actually compare it to our traditional therapies. If we were to think about surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. In fact, for, for any therapy for cancer, one of the key fundamental considerations is that how does the therapy, how do you distinguish healthy tissue from diseased tissue? So clearly in surgery, this is fairly straightforward. You hope your surgeon's got a pretty good hand and they can actually go straight for the tumour. Radiotherapy is really advancing. There's all kinds of new sequences that... Um, uh, are highly precise, that can target um, very specific areas. Chemotherapy, the, drug, the drugs are also becoming more specific. You generally try to target oncogenic pathways, uh, mutations in malignant cells, highly dividing proliferative cells. So there are all these techniques, but fundamentally specificity is always an issue when we think about our traditional therapies. In, the other major thing about our traditional therapies is that they all target the malignant tissue directly. So the thing about cancer immunotherapy is that it doesn't target the malignant tissue. It targets the immune system, and we ask the immune system to target the malignant tissue. And so you're going to say, well, why do you want to do that? And the reason we want to do that is because over many years of evolution, depending on what you think, the immune system has evolved to these highly exquisite mechanisms that has the ability to distinguish disease tissue from healthy. So we know about antibodies. Antibodies are molecules, they're proteins produced by B cells. They can recognise differences on the surface of foreign bodies. They bind to these molecular um, differences. They, they tag that substance or foreign body for destruction by the immune system. 
The other thing that the immune system can do is that it has this amazing memory phenotype. So back in 1918, there was a flu epidemic. So people that are still alive from that today, well, actually, this was back in 2005. Hopefully, there are some people alive today, maybe not. Um, um, still, you could still measure the antibody titers in their blood to that flu. That was the first H1N1 strain reported. And that's incredible. Some hundred years later, you could measure the um, antibody titer. So that's the difference between the immune system and our standard therapies. Of course, T cells are a little bit more complicated. We have to somehow explain because T cells, this is a picture here of a T cell. It's recognised a tumour cell and it's about to kill it. So how does it do that? And, and we have to explain that. It's a very similar mechanism by which a T cell can recognise a virally infected cell. So you might know that viruses tend to infect cells from the inside. They get in, they take over the cellular machinery. Well, an infected cell, in fact, all cells have this machinery where proteins inside the cell can be degraded. So this is, this is representing a protein, so that's a lot of those amino acids all joined together. If, if there's something wrong with that protein, maybe it's a bit heavily oxidated, it's just lived its life cycle. If it's a foreign protein, such as a viral protein, the, inside the cell that can be recognised and it can be degraded by the proteasome into these little fragments known as peptides. So the protein is chopped up, and then there's an amazing uh, network where it's loaded inside the cell onto these MHC molecules. And they look very, very similar to those lipid antigen presentation molecules that was on the other slide from DIRT. The difference is, is that these MHC molecules, they are presenting peptides on the surface, not uh, glycolipids or, or lipids. And so they're secreted out onto the surface and they have this little peptide in the binding clef. That little peptide, if it's coming from a mutated protein that's causing malignancy, we would call that peptide a tumour-associated antigen. And if we appropriately train T cells, we would then call them um, CTLs, they can recognise this complex and they can tell that that, or, or they decide that that cell is um, diseased and they can dispose of it in a controlled fashion. Okay, so this is maybe a little bit complicated, but... <laughs> If we want to actually make a vaccine, um, we have to actually supply at least a couple of signals. There are more signals, but in, in, in terms of a T cell getting appropriate signals, it needs to be able to see the antigen, and this is what I just talked about. This is one signal, the MHC molecule, the tumour-associated antigen, provides a signal to the T cell, but that's not enough to turn it into a CTL, into a killer cell. It needs a second signal, and that second signal is something that we might call co-stimulation. In terms of vaccine design, the vaccine, the part of the vaccine that provides co-stimulation, we call it an, an immune stimulant, or we might call it a vaccine adjuvant. So a vaccine needs to have one of those, and then if the vaccine has the peptide antigen, the tumour-associated antigen, potentially we have a vaccine. And I like to use this term, clustering of events in vaccine design, and what we need to get, we need to get these two signals to the same place and they need to act in a coordinated fashion. And really, the whole design of our vaccines is around this concept. And it doesn't matter how good you are at chemistry. You can't do chemistry if you don't know what the design looks like. OK, so Ian, I won't go into the details. So this is Ian's trajectory of, of research. Basically, if you're going to make a vaccine, you need to have an immune stimulant. Most immune stimulants activate the antigen-presenting cell directly. Ian's trajectory of research was to use, it's a little bit confusing, another kind of T-cell, special kind of weird T-cell called an NK T-cell. And, and if you could activate an NK T-cell, that could provide the stimulatory signal back to the APC. And so this is really cool because not too many people in the world are working on this. Um, so our, our research is complementary to what most people are doing. And the molecule that would do that, well, a molecule that would do it, was this molecule called alpha-galactosyl ceramide. So hopefully now we can see we've got some lipid and we've got some sugar. Okay, so then when Ian came back from Oxford, 
you know, he kindly asked me if I could make this molecule. And, you know, it had some good attributes and it had some good things. And I went back to my checklist of what we're trying to achieve. But, you know, it was certainly what the biologists and immunologists wanted. But I couldn't see how we could make um, intellectual property around this compound. It had already been discovered in 1995. Heaps of people had been working on it. But, you know, I sighed and I thought, well, you know, it's what he needs. So we come up with some novel chemistry. So we made a nucleophile and an electrophile. We brought them together in a reaction, a chemical reaction we call a glycosylation reaction. One of the problems in the field was that this linkage could often be scrambled. You got minor impurities. If you wanted your friends at glycosin to get involved in manufacture, they didn't want to know about impurities that were close running and hard to separate. So we could justify doing this work by coming up with some novel chemistry to make the compound. Adrian did that work. We were able to supply that to Ian, and it did the kind of things that he wanted it to do. So we won't go into any details here, but we were able to use that, that protocol or a variation of that protocol in the manufacturing process with glycosin. Um, people, uh, Margaret Brimble's group up in Auckland, designed some synthetic long peptides, and Ian's group at Maligan uh, have expertise in cellular vaccines, making an uh, autologous dendritic cell vaccine. So there's an ongoing clinical trial now where we load all these components onto these uh, cells uh, that originally come from uh, patients. So we're in no position to talk about the, the data from that trial at this time. Um, but whilst uh, clinical trials go on, uh, we carry on our research. So this is some research in glioblastoma, again from Ian's group, the people are, are recognised at the bottom. So as we know, glioblastoma is an incredibly debilitating uh, disease. And one of the techniques, a different kind of vaccine that you can make, if you're able to actually surgically remove some of the tumour, you can actually use the tumour as materials for a vaccine. There are a lot of immunogenic materials in the tumour itself um, that are potentially useful. Of course, there are a lot of things in there you might not want as well. But if you do that and then you load on an immune stimulant, so you have to inactivate, obviously, the tumour cells once you get them out. You don't want them growing again. Infuse them back into the patient. Um, you potentially have a vaccine. So this is some data from a preclinical study. And we have survival on the vertical axis, and we have time um, coming along the horizontal axis. And, and generally what you see is the tumour-only group come down. That means they receive no therapeutic treatment those animals come down quite quickly uh, to the brain cancer. And in this case, this vaccine, and although we knew it was immunogenic, it didn't really seem to have a huge effect. The vaccine wasn't really working. So that was a bit of a problem, but what Lindsay and Cam were able to do was they were able to recognise some of the latest research and thought, well, actually, we need to com combine this vaccination with something called immunomodulation. And this immunomodulation is what all the publicity is about right now. Keytruda is an example of an immunomodulator. And so now we can see is that when we add the immunomodulator in, up in this top graph, 80% of these animals are protected. And this isn't just protection, this is a therapeutic model, it's an intracranial model, it's a, it's a spectacular result. And it's not like the tumours never grew. If you do some imaging, these are the mice that survived and that were uh, cured, if you like. You can see some tumours and they're completely regressed at a later time point. Absolutely amazing. And then if we do the fancy immunology and use some knockouts, we can prove that the addition of the simple chemical was the difference. Without that chemical, you didn't get uh, the anti-tumour activity. Of course, you needed all the other bits as well. So then really briefly... Um, you need to just talk about checkpoint block A as quickly as I can. So I talked about these two signals. That's what you need to do to activate up a T cell. But activated T cells are fairly full on, fairly nasty, especially in the wrong environment. So this is an example of allergic contact dermatitis. And this is actually, well, the dermatitis is maybe not a normal process, but it's actually T cells killing haptonized cells. So cells that the body has recognized as allergic. So T cells are powerful. After they do the job that they're supposed to do, they need to be turned off. So the body has natural mechanisms to turn down a T cell response. And this is really amazing molecular biology. So you have this signal to 
cause the T cell to be activated or both of them. But then what happens is the T cell upregulates similar cell surface molecules onto the surface. But now they're not called co-stimulatory molecules, they're called, co they're called suppressor molecules. CTLA-4 is one of those molecules. And what it does is it has a similar architecture to CD28. In other words, it recognises the same target as CD28, but it binds with higher specificity. So it displaces that target, and, and then it has a different intracellular signaling domain, and it basically surprise, supplies negative signals to the T cells. You turn off the T cell response, and that's normal. And people that have um, defects in this suppressive mechanism often are susceptible to autoimmune disease. Okay, so it's a natural mechanism. What these drugs do, and in fact, Franca um, actually had this idea in the late 90s at the Maligan Research, various reasons it didn't work, and that's because the drug anti ctla 4 doesn't work in a C57 back in the particular tumour they're looking at. So in the late 90s, they could have been the first to have shown this, but there you go. And <clears throat> anyway, and so what happens is, is that if you can make a monoclonal antibody that binds really strongly to the negative res um, receptor, you basically block the negative signal. So two negatives obviously make a positive. We all learn that in maths. So off you go and you can release T cell function. And this is exactly how these drugs are working. This is what's changed the field. This is real clinical data from people with metastatic melanoma. The graph over there, they're individual people. They all started out with metastatic melanoma. There was really not a lot of hope for any of these people. No long-term hope of survival. Um, then in this treatment, it shows anyone that comes, any line that comes below the, the line here, they're actually getting better. And effectively, around 50% of people were actually cured from metastatic melanoma. This treatment that I want to point out, it's not one of these drugs alone. It's two drugs combined. So this is the drug here. One of the drugs is PE1. This is the one that's getting all the publicity. It's called Keytruda. But if you combine Keytruda with ipilimumab, you end up getting this profound effect. So when you see the stuff that's in the, in the news, just remember that the, probably the best treatments are going to be combinations. They're going to be even more expensive and more complicated than what we're talking about already. So we won't talk about CAR... Uh, T cells because we don't have time, but then I come to this, and there's some, a lot of articles coming out like this. But can we afford the war on cancer? You know, these treatments are really expensive. What are we going to do? And I mean, all I would say to that, yes, they are expensive. They are creating some social problems. But you know, we just have to think back to the first computer that was built. Do we ever think that people would have personal computers? And I think the answer to that is no. So. Even so, it's really part of our concept is that could we actually develop an off-the-shelf synthetic form of the vaccines? The vaccines I've talked about so far, they were cellular vaccines. They're complicated to make. Um, probably we're not going to be able to ever commercialise those to large numbers of, of the population that need them. So, in theory, we can make everything we need synthetically. The antigen bit can come on the right hand side down here. This is synthetic um, solid phase synthetic peptide synthesis. I want to thank Margaret Brimble's group through the MWC who really helped us with that a lot. And now I thank uh, Victoria University of Wellington for their kind support. We have our own peptide synthesizer. Um, so we're able to now do this chemistry ourselves with some help from Auckland. Uh, this is Taylor who's really excited because she's about to spend the next three years working on the machine. <laughs> and other things. And then the chemistry. So I kind of have taken a bit long, so I'm just going to skip through really quickly. So my favourite reaction used to be that conjugate addition to the enone, but the favourite chemistry that I like doing now has nothing to do with protecting groups. We do something called bioorthogonal conjugation. That means we design chemical reactions that can take place in the presence of proteins and peptides. And it's, a, it's phenomenal chemistry, and I'm really fortunate to be able to do that. And, and what we've effectively done here is we've combined the adjuvant, the immune stimulant, to the antigen. We bring them together, and we basically get a profound immunological response. By doing that, this is a, on the vertical axis, we have a measure of the T cell response, and we basically show that when we conjugate, this is what this compound for is, we get a much better immune response by conjugation. You can look at this work in detail. It's been published um, 
just a few years ago. If you look at some anti-tumor activity, it's just not a, um, immune, an immunological response. We can also get increased anti-tumor activity. And then my favorite of favorite of all reactions, but I'm not going to be able to tell you because I can see Mike is starting to fidget, is this um, strain-promoted azide-alkyne cyclo-addition. So Paul's going to love us in the manufacturing plant because this chemical reaction happens by putting two solutions together at room temperature. No heating, no catalyst, no purification. Okay, and that's what it looks like. We can take it through and we um, can have a look in glioma. We can make a brain cancer um, vaccine. So I needed to really talk more about our company, but clearly don't have time. But just, you know, despite popular belief, when you make a company, you don't actually have lots of money. And if you do, it's actually going to be paying for something called a clinical trial. And so it's not really going to support our ongoing research, although it'll do what it can. To make money back out of our science, we have to take these steps in New Zealand. We have to be able to run clinical trials in New Zealand. If we sell our technology early, then we get... Um, it's very difficult to maintain long-term benefit um, to New Zealand. Right, so we'll just fly through and so... This was a picture I stole off one of Ian's presentations. I hope he's happy with that. I didn't mean to ring a mask and didn't quite get to it. But this beautiful vista of Wellington. We're now in a position that together with the Maligan, we're taking our technology and we're actually taking it all around the world. We have intellectual property on this technology. We're getting world-leading groups wanting to work um, on our discoveries. And so this is really exciting. There's a huge number of people to thank. Obviously, you can't do anything alone. Uh, for me, it's been a lot about collaboration but clearly the team. And, you know, the team, uh, Regan Anderson, Colin Heyman and Benji Compton have done most of this work over the last um, three or four years, and it's absolutely sensational. So almost there, Mike. And so I also need to thank a few other things happened. I want to thank uh, Liz and Graham, and that was because a few years ago, I just thought I needed to learn some more immunology so we could connect better with our collaborators. So this... Um, so Graham kindly hosted me at the Maligan Institute for a year. Richard supported that, and Liz got the great job to show a chemist how to, what way to hold a mouse. So it was a fantastic experience for me, um, and really appreciated. We have to thank the Ferrier family for being able to take Robin's name for our institute. Robin has chemical reactions named after him. It gives us purpose, it gives us history, and I have to say... You know, I think it's a fantastic opportunity uh, to use the family name. We'd also like to thank the Victoria University of Wellington when we moved across from where we were before. 25, 30 <coughs> professional scientists joining, joining your ranks all at once is quite a big thing. And, you know, we've been welcomed by staff in the chemical and physical sciences and, and both the biological sciences. So thank you. And especially thank you to Mike, you've done a huge amount of work. All right, so last thing. Um, so the inspirational thing for me was that actually when I first went to school, actually I found, I actually enjoyed school, but I actually didn't particularly like teaching. Um, I found, I actually didn't like learning, sorry. Um, I thought it was all kind of a bit weird, but somewhere along the line something changed and, um, and, and I put it back to this person here, this teacher, this is Eti Lafiso and she made teaching pa. Um, and so I'm just going to play a little thing. I'll try and skip my... And I didn't know... South Island now, where the Pacific Islands community of Dunedin is mourning the death of one of its founding figures. Agnes Mary Laufiso, better known as Ete Laufiso, lost her battle with a second brain tumour last Saturday. Lisa Talma has more about this Pacific pioneer. When the time comes for me to die, I have lived as much as I have, lived, lived a life to the fullest then, and enjoyed it, and I thank God for letting me live. Community leader, teacher, revolutionist, visionary, the adjectives that have coloured Eti Laufiso's life have been many. Okay, so what I'll do is, I'm going to stop that because Mike's really moving in. And so what Etty did for me is, like I said, she made teaching fun. And what she did is she brought that... Actually, there should be two sticks. I couldn't find the picture on the internet. But she brought that along to class. And I can say in 1978 in Otago, you didn't have too much um, kapahaka going on. So this was an amazing thing. And it was a real release, and I really enjoyed it. 
And, you know, I'm going to just tell one story really quickly, Mike. And so <laughs> the thing that she did, and I know some people are going to say, well, maybe this, you know, maybe this isn't the best. But what she did, you know, she did the, the maths timetable and she would get the whole class up. We would line up in two rows and you would all face the blackboard and you would pair off. And then she would ask the front two people to turn around and she would write the times table on the blackboard. That's what she would do. Now, the whole class, everyone that was standing back, they could see the equation and they could learn the answer. She would then um, yell out, turn. People would turn around, and it would be a competition. And it was a competition. Whoever was first, they got to stay up. Whoever didn't, you know, if you weren't fast enough, you um, lost. And basically, this went on, and you actually had a winner. But... You know, the people that won were different every time, and the whole class participated into, into this um, exercise. And I actually found that a whole lot of fun, and I actually learned something about maths. So thank you, Etty, and that's it. Good evening. Um, hello, my name is Professor Mike Wilson, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculties of Science, Engineering, Architecture, and Design, and also have the pleasure of having responsibility for the Ferre Institute. Um, it's also my pleasure and privilege to give the vote of thanks to Gavin for tonight's lecture, which I'm sure you'll agree with me was wonderful. Um, so thank you, Gavin, for the interesting and inspiring lecture you've delivered and for the insight you've shared with us about the fu possible futures of cancer treatment. Um, finding a cure for cancer is an aspiration for countless scientists across the globe and attracts more public interest and not to mention funding um, than perhaps any other form of modern scientific endeavour. This is, this is hardly surprising when one considers the number of peoples affected by this disease and the challenge of current treatments which can in themselves have a profound effect on the health of, the pa of patients. Every year, more than 40 million people worldwide are diagnosed with cancer. In New Zealand, we have one of the highest rates of cancer in the world and is one of the leading causes of death in men and women. It is truly a massive global issue. The research of Professor Painter and his colleagues helping to develop immunotherapies that have the potential to be not only effective but better tolerated than conventional treatments is of incredible importance. Can cancer immunotherapy has been described as a revolution in cancer treatment. It was named the breakthrough of the year in 2013 by the highly respected journal Science uh, and, and is undoubtedly the most promising cancer, cancer treatment since the development of the first chemotherapies in the 1940s. Recently, in the US, the Cancer Moonshot 2020 was announced. This is a coalition of multinational pharmaceutical and biotech companies, academic centers, and community oncologists, which has the goal of finding vaccine-based immunotherapies against cancer. In other words, the very same treatments as Gavin and his team are developing. Although we were still in the early stages of realizing the potential of this approach, the research that Professor Painter and the Ferry Institute, in collaboration with the Maligan Institute, is already showing promise, as we've heard. The potential of this research ex extends beyond medical applications. Gavin's work is heavy, helping to create industries and commercial returns for science in New Zealand. And these new industries and jobs offer, offer opportunities for up-and-coming researchers and, and science students alike and can help position New Zealand as a leading contributor in scientific discovery, discoveries and research excellence. Professor Painter has established an international reputation in chemical immunology and has published extensively in leading academic journals and has attracted significant funding um, through both research grants and patents. Um, so he tells me. Um, in 2014, he was made a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Chemistry, an award given in recognition of individuals who have made substantial contributions to chemistry. 
His promotion to professor at Victor, Victoria is very well deserved, and we're extremely proud to have him on our staff. I'd like to end by going back to the Cancer, Cancer Moonshot Coalition. The name of this coalition is a deliberate echo of the famous address of, at Rice University in Texas in 1962 by President John F. Kennedy when he announced his nation's intention of putting a man on the moon. It is famous, we choose to go to the moon speech. Um, I'd like to quote from that speech and slightly paraphrase it because the soaring aspiration it expressed is, is I think, most relevant um, to the present situation. Kennedy said, we choose to do this thing not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our skills and energy. Because the challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Thank you, Gavin, for your, ten, your talk tonight. We wish you well in your challenge. Thank you very much. <laughs>